Hello and welcome to video lecture series in political science. Today we are going to discuss chapter 1 titled as Cold War from your textbook Contemporary World Politics. For understanding we have divided this chapter into 6 parts. So far in the first 2-3 parts we have discussed about the end of Second World War, Cuban Missile Crisis, Cold War and the concept of deterrence that prevented the two superpowers to use or fight against each other. We have also discussed about Iron Curtain that ran through or ran across Europe dividing it into East and West Bloc and the ideological divide. Today in this episode we will discuss about the conflicts that occurred during the Cold War and how the two superpowers or the nuclear powers entered into treaties and agreements to ban use of nuclear weapons against each other. So let's begin. The Cuban Missile Crisis is just one example of the several crises that occurred during the Cold War. In order to demonstrate their superiority, both the superpowers were in constant competition with each other to win supporters all over the world. Now these supporters or supporting nations were provided what? They were given economic help, they were given military help also and also strength of friendship against their neighbours in their respective regions with, with whom they had competing interests. Now both the superpowers were flexing their muscles in different regions of the world. In fact, in, they were determining the nature of world politics and regional politics to large extent in all these regions. In one of the statements it said, when US sneezes the entire world catches cold. So you can imagine how influential they were at the global political level. Now in the process both the superpowers were also enhancing or they were increasing their military capacity and they were building their military bases in the territory of these supporting nations or smaller nations who were aligning with their ideological interest. In this game both the supporting nations and the superpower of a particular bloc gained from association with each other. And this relationship between the respective power and supporting nation was based on their mutual self-interest. They get something else in the return of what they get. But during this era, a large number of violent conflicts, small and medium scale wars happened. The superpowers, both of them were directly or indirectly involved or engaged in these conflicts. But fortunately enough, none of them came out openly against each other, face off and did not create conditions for another world war. Why did this happen? Why did they not come across each other? The reason is that because the images of devastation that was caused by the atomic bombs were witnessed by the entire world, including these superpowers as well. And after seeing the scale or magnitude of devastation, Nobody could have dared to make a mistake to put themselves as target for the other person because both of them knew that they are under the attack. On 6th of August 1945, as you know, a uranium bomb of 20 kilotons yield was exploded 1850 feet above in the air over Hiroshima for its maximum explosive effect. And as you can see in this picture, this bomb devastated four square miles of area and it killed 1,40,000 people of the total almost 2,50,000 population of the entire region. Now we look at some of the pictures and these pictures of devastation have been taken by Yosuke Yamahata and these pictures were taken one day after bombing of Nagasaki in 1945. This is the 10th of August. He went around the site and he clicked the picture, these are the first picture to be released after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now in this particular picture you can see the military trucks, you know they have been, almost everything has been shattered around other than couple of buildings that you can see in the background which are erect and all burnt trees, you know only the stalks are now half partially burnt left. In this particular picture, which is quite disturbing also, you can see a large number of charred bodies, the burnt bodies of people strewn around. 
as you know during a atomic bomb explosion the temperature rises up to 2000 degree and what can be the fate of people or what would be the condition of things around this is one of the important cathedral building at the time of the bombing a large number of people were praying inside and it is estimated that all of them died instantly as soon as the bomb exploded and these are the remains of that catholic church and in this picture not much is seen or decipherable because everything is mangled everything has been reduced to heap and this shows a kind of truck which is parked and it has been also burnt and this picture will show you or it demonstrates the kind of effect any atomic bomb or nuclear explosion can bring about on people the first picture is of hiroshima before the destruction and the other picture is of hiroshima only after the destruction and it's the same area with that mountain in the background and now you see the entire city has been reduced to plain so despite being very rigid or inflexible on their respective ideologies or ideological stand and despite their reluctance to change their position somehow both the powers did not come or come across each other or cross the limits that could have led to the war causing such amount of destruction or such magnitude of destruction in fact these images could have deterred them more than the logic of deterrence yes they were on the verge of entering into a direct military confrontation in korea during 1950s once again in congo during 1960s and in berlin from 1958 to 62 a large number of people and military personnel died in these small or medium wars particularly in afghanistan vietnam and korea let us discuss these two wars vietnam war where us was involved and the afghanistan war where is the soviet union was involved let's begin with the vietnam war the vietnam war was the prolonged struggle between the nationalist forces in vietnam and the us forces on the other hand the war was fought between the two groups one group was north vietnam supported by the soviet union and other communist allies of the soviet union and the other group in the confrontation was the government of south vietnam and the government of south vietnam was supported by the us and the other anti communist allies along with the united states the nationalist forces were attempting to unify the country of vietnam under a communist government on the other hand united states with the aid of the south vietnamese government was attempting to prevent the spread of communism in the region this war was a part of containment strategy with the clear aim of stopping the spread of communism what is containment containment means to restrict somebody to contain somebody and containment strategy was a kind of strategy that was designed in order to stop spread of communism in any region of the world now in fact there was a widespread anti vietnam war movement against the war that happened in the western world and this anti vietnam war struggle happened particularly in the us and major countries of europe during the 1960s this includes germany france and the uk the soviet union also invaded afghanistan like the us did for the vietnam the soviet union invaded afghanistan during 1979 by sending its military troops to afghanistan now why did it do so the soviet union intervened in the support of the communist government of afghanistan this government was in conflict with anti communist muslim guerrillas and this is called as the afghan war which protracted or continued from 1978 to 1992 and the soviet troops remained in afghanistan till the end of february of 1989 a long time now this event began a brutal decade long attempt by russians to reduce the afghan civil war and they wanted to maintain a friendly and socialist government on its border because afghanistan neighbors russia but this war was a watershed event of the cold war and this was the only time the soviet union invaded a country outside the eastern bloc 
Now, both the rival blocs and their respective allies were in a constant process of helping the groups supporting their respective ideologies in wars and conflicts all over the world, as you can see in these two cases clearly now. And the war of ideas became a source of conflict that claimed millions of lives world over in such smaller civil wars or military conflicts or coup. The Cold War was manifest in almost the, all the spheres of global matrix, but it took most dangerous shape in the weapons race. This Cold War rivalry between the two powers was an outcome of the mutual suspicion that they had for each other. As a result of this suspicion that the other bloc might become powerful, both the rival powers armed themselves from right from beginning and more and more and more and more was being stocked in order to be consistently prepared for the war. Both of them thought that increasing their stock of weapons will threaten the other and piling up of arms was considered necessary to deter the other, that is the logic of deterrence. And they also intended to demonstrate the other block that they have better capacity to damage you and they were constantly preparing themselves for war. If it happens, we should be ready for it. The stockpiling of weapons because of this perceived or imagined threat, mutual threat which was imagined by both of them, led to the rise in expenditure on military and war equipment. That is most of their budget was spent on the purchase of military equipment. Reeling under the constant threat of war, despite restraint, the rival powers thought that in the event of war, their capacity should not be proved less than the capacity of the other. At times, even the diplomatic talks between the two failed and the strained relationship once again surfaced on the global political level. But somehow, by the grace of God, the world was still saved from any nuclear war. In fact, it had become a mad rush for strengthening the military might among both of them. In the process, the small countries too joined the race and they also started spending huge amount on building their capacities in order to dominate in the regional equations. Fortunately, here also the logic of deterrence kept the real war from happening, but there was tension prevailing all over the world. But imagine, none of these superpowers thought, what if a tragedy happens within their own country? Imagine they never thought of what will happen if a nuclear accident takes place within the territory of their own nation. What if an act of sabotage by the enemy happens within their own country? These questions and related concerns after some time of the Cold War led to signing of certain significant agreements and treaties between the two nuclear powers. It happened during middle of the 1960s and 70s. Both the US and the USSR decided to limit and eliminate certain kinds of nuclear weapons. They decided that a stable balance of power can be achieved through arm control treaties to some extent. Otherwise, the things will either go in the favor of one or the other. Several rounds of diplomatic talks and arms limitation talks were held between both of them. Both of them and many other nuclear states existing at that point of time signed certain important treaties to limit and control production and use of nuclear weapons. Let us discuss some of these important treaties. The first treaty that we will discuss is called as LTBT, that is Limited Test Ban Treaty. Now this treaty banned tests of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, in the outer space and under the water, that is testing the strength or might of a nuclear weapon in these areas. This treaty was signed by the US, the UK and the USSR in Moscow on 5th August 1963 and the treaty entered into force on 10th of October 1963. Entered into force means that it became functional or operational from this date. The second treaty is Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This treaty NPT allows only the nuclear weapon states to have nuclear weapons and it stops other states from acquiring them. 
For the purpose of NPT, a nuclear weapon state is one which has manufactured and exploded a nuclear weapon or other nuclear explosives prior to 1st January 1967. What does this mean? That if in case you are in possession of nuclear weapons prior to 1st January 1967, then you are a nuclear state and you are allowed to retain these nuclear weapons. But if in case you haven't done it till this date, 1st January 1967 and you intend to do something, then you are not allowed to develop nuclear weapons or do any explosion. And so, in such a case, there were only five nuclear weapon states till then, the US, the USSR, Britain, France and China. NPT was signed on 1st of July 1968 and it entered into force on 5th March 1972, years after the signing of the NPT. It was extended indefinitely in 1995. You will explore more about it when you will learn that India did not sign this treaty. The third important treaty was Strategic Arms Limitation Talks 1. This is also abbreviated as SALT 1. It is easy for you to remember this. The first round of strategic arms limitation talks began in November of 1969. The Soviet leader Brezhnev and the US president, the then president Richard Nixon on 26th May 1972 in Moscow signed two important treaties within this. One was treaty on the limitation of anti-ballistic missile systems that is ABM treaty. The second component of the treaty was the interim agreement on the limitation of strategic offensive arms. These agreements entered into force on 3rd of October 1972. The next treaty which is strategic arms limitation talk 2. This was the second round started in November 1972. The US President Jimmy Carter and the Soviet leader Brezhnev signed this treaty on the limitation of strategic offensive arms in Vienna. It was signed on 18th of June 1979. Along with SALT 1 and 2, there are two other treaties, START 1 and 2. What are these two? START 1 is the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty 1, which was signed by Mikhail Gorbachev, the President of the USSR, and George Bush, the Senior, the President of the United States. This treaty was for the reduction and limitation of strategic offensive arms, and it was signed in Moscow during July 1991. START 2, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, this was signed by Boris Yeltsin, the President of Russia after the disintegration of USSR and the US President George Bush the Senior on reduction and limitation of strategic offensive arms in Moscow and this was done in January 1993. Now before we move on to the next important section of this chapter that is NAM, Non-Aligned Movement. Let's look at the chronology of events during the Gold War era. In 1947, American President Harry Truman puts forward doctrine about the containment of communism, that is, we will not allow communism to spread. From 1947 to 52, the United States extend economic help or aid for the reconstruction of the Western Europe called as Marshall Plan. From 1948 to 49, Berlin blockade happens by the Soviet Union and the US supplies military equipment and other things to the citizens of the Berlin and West Germany. In 1955, signing of Baghdad Pact took place and later on it was called as Sento. In 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis happened. The construction of Berlin Wall begins during 1960s, dividing East and West Berlin into two rival blocks and the Europe particularly into two separate blocks. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev becomes the president of the USSR and he begins the reform process. And after three, four years and during these years only in 1989, mass protests happened against the governments in the Eastern Europe, that was the Eastern Alliance or the group of countries which were under the Soviet influence. And one after another, all these countries rejected communism and the new democratic forms of governments came into existence in these countries. In 1990, with the fall of Berlin Wall, the Germany was unified. And in 1991, the Soviet Union got disintegrated. And with the disintegration of Soviet Union, one says the Cold War came to an end. This was called as an end of the Cold War era. 
it would not be an exaggeration to say that during the Cold War, when the world was divided between the two rival blocs, general tensions prevailed all over the global politics. Some of the efforts to neutralize or minimize these tensions were made through signing of these armed control treaties, but they were also having their limitations. All through this era of tension and excitement, there were some nations that were not part of the either of the two rival blocs. Who were these countries and what role did they play during the Cold War? How did they organize themselves? What were their goals? We will discuss about all these issues in the next part of this chapter. To conclude, let's summarize what we discussed in this episode. In this episode, we discussed about Vietnam War and Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. We also discussed about certain arms control treaties and agreements between the two superpower, namely LTBT, NPT, SALT 1 and 2, which is the limitation treaty, and START 1 and 2, which is the reduction treaty. And towards the end, we discussed about the important years and dates, that is the chronology of important events during the Cold War. In the next part of this chapter, we will discuss about NAM, N-A-M, that is Non-Aligned Movement. And we will also discuss about its success and failure on the global stage. Till then, you can enjoy reading this part of the chapter. Thank you. Thank you.